welcome back to the channel. My name is Zach, and this is Gloria, and today's Thursday, so we have a new theological term. Gloria, are you super pumped holding your little basketball? All right, maybe sometime in this video we can dunk on Milo? Ooh. Ah. Yes, okay. Ah. Today's word is omnipresence. Gloria, can you say omnipresence? No? That's okay. Omnipresence means all present or in every place. So when we talk about God's omnipresence, that basically means that God is everywhere at all times, but he's not conformed or, or prevented from only being in one particular place at once. He's everywhere. So God is present with every point of space in his entire being. And God's omnipresence is closely linked to his transcendence, which basically is the idea and the principle that God is transcendent above all things. And we'll definitely talk about that in another theological term Thursday. So, Glory, what is the biblical evidence for omnipresence? You know, when we look in the Bible, we don't see the word omnipresence, just like we didn't see omnipotence or omniscience. And just like when we look in the Bible, we don't see the word Bible or Trinity. But we know that these, these concepts are there because there's biblical evidence of them. So let's look at some of the biblical evidence for God's omnipresence. And if you'd like to pause the video at any point and check out these scriptures, be sure to do that. Are you waving? All right. So God is the creator and he's the possessor of all things. Heaven and earth cannot contain him. We see from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. And that's in reference to the tabernacle, the temple of God. And this is evidence from Isaiah 66, 1, which says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? He fills heaven and earth, so nothing is hidden from his presence. And he is both far and he is both near at the same time. This is evident by Psalm 139, verses 7 to 13, which we actually talked about in last week's video. But it says, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, and your right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me, and the light around me will be night, even the darkness is dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to you, for you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. In Jeremiah 23, verses 23 to 24 says, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places, so I do not see him, declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. Exactly, Gloria. Exactly. And then we see in Acts 17, verses 27 to 28, it says that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. And God manifests himself variously in various places. God dwells and he has his throne in heaven. God descends from heaven. God dwells in the midst of his people. And in terms of relationship, God is far from the wicked relationally. And God is close relationally to the righteous. And Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ultimately, God indwells the church, the people of God. And despite all of this, God is imminent, and he is actively working within the world to establish his kingdom. And he is actively doing everything behind the scenes, upholding the universe, sustaining the universe, and working through his people to carry out his purposes for his kingdom, for the advancement of the gospel, and all these different things. And even Jesus himself promised before he went to heaven and ascended on high to sit at the right hand of God, he, a prom he made a promise to his disciples that I am with you even to the end of the age 
age. And we see that since Pentecost, which is recorded in Acts chapter 2 for us, that the Holy Spirit dwells in all of those who repent and trust in the person and work of Christ. He dwells in the body of believers. So with God's omnipresence, that means he sees and knows everything because he is everywhere at once. And so God's omnipresence is closely linked to his omnipotence and also his omniscience. Because he is ever, everywhere at once, all present, he is all knowing about everything. And that means he is also all powerful to carry out everything according to his will and through his people. And something that also needs to be said is that when we talk about God's omnipresence, we are not saying that God is like, you know, the the force, like in Star Wars, you know, it, that God is not pantheistic. You know, there's not God in everything. When, you know, someone dies and they become one with, you know, the force, that is not what God is about. His omnipresence is way cooler than that, and it's way more glorious because he is constantly everywhere at every given point of time in any given point of space. And because of that, he is all-knowing and all-powerful, and he uses all of it to bring glory to him. And so it's an important distinction that I think we need to also consider. And the beauty of this is that God is always present with his people, and he is always with them despite the circumstances that take place. We see in Isaiah 43, 2 that it says, When you pass through the waters, I, that's God speaking, will be with you, and through the rivers they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched nor will the flame burn you. So that's saying that through the trials of life, God is with his people. And so when we have repented and trusted in the person and work of Christ, that Christ lived the life that we were supposed to live, and he died in our place on behalf of us and took the guilt of our sin, and it was laid upon him, and his perfect righteousness was transferred to us, and he died a gruesome death that we deserved, and then God raised him from the dead on the third day, thus declaring to the world that Jesus was who he says he was, and that everything he said about everything was true and accurate. When we have done that, then God is with us, and God indwells us with his Holy Spirit, and thus he is with us always, even to the end of the age. And so that is a beauty and a comfort and a joy to all those who have done that, to all genuine believers. And some great significance from God's omnipresence is that because he is always present and always with us, we can enjoy real communion with him without having to go to someone specifically to experience the presence of God. If God is with you and indwells you by his Holy Spirit because you have repented and trusted in the person and work of Christ, then you have communion with him, real communion, and you have access to him at any moment. You don't have to go to some priest to do that because that's not biblical. And ultimately, God's omnipresence guarantees and assures the believer that he is with us and he's watching over us and he's protecting us and he's only allowing things to happen to us that are ultimately for our good and for his glory. And that includes God's discipline because the Lord loves those whom he chastises, the son whom he scourges. And so we will be disciplined in this life as believers, but God disciplines us as a father lovingly disciplines a child, not as a judge would discipline a criminal because in Christ we are children of God, but outside of Christ we are criminals being judged by God. So ultimately, God upholds the created order by being entirely present in every point of space. And this is true, for example, even with heaven and hell. We see in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 10, it says, Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also... He also will drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So we know from Scripture, because of God's omnipresence, he is everywhere. And that means that the Lamb himself, Jesus, will pour out judgment on people in hell someday. And it's, you know, we see from Scripture that being in hell means that you are away from the loving presence of the Lord. So you do not have fellowship with Him, but you will only experience His divine wrath and His judgment. So we can say that God is with time and space rather than being in time and space. Although technically, He is in both categories 
as long as we see God not of time or being bound by time, because God is outside of time, but he is also with time and space. So it's obviously something that's hard to think about, but that's okay, because if we could fully understand these things, then why would we worship God in the first place? God is completely other than us, and we'll definitely talk about this in another video too, but in terms of the otherness of God, God is completely separate and other than everything else. We have two circles here. God is here and everything else is here. All right, Gloria, that is God's omnipresence. Can I get a high five? All right, that was a very dainty high five. Oh, you're just going to get up and walk away? Okay. If you found this video to be helpful, be sure to like it and share it with others so that they can learn more about God's omnipresence. If you haven't already done so, be sure to consider subscribing to the channel and hit the bell notification next to the red button so that you'll be notified by email whenever we post a new video or go live. And if you'd like to support us in other ways, you can check out our Patreon page or our SDG merch page. And both of those links are in the description. And I'll throw one up here in the info card. And if you would like to receive two free stocks, then check out the link in our description, which will take you to Webull, which is a website that is a brokerage account, and you can sign up You'll receive one free stock yeah. value between $2.50 and $250. Yeah. And then when you yeah. deposit $100 into that brokerage account, yeah. you will receive a stock value between $12 and $1,400. So do that today and comment in the, in the comment section and let us know what two stocks you got. This is the SDG by ZAC. Soli Deo Gloria. To God alone be the glory. With Theological Terms Thursday with Gloria. We wish you providential blessings. Take care. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> Want to dunk on Milo? I think that will be hilarious. Hilarious. She dunks on him! Oh! Yay! Did yelling just then hurt your head? Yeah. Did yelling give you a headache? It's okay, come in, come in, it's okay.